Sometimes I think about what it would be like if the government sent me $20,000 as an apology. Just a simple, I'm sorry we removed your family from your home during World War II just because you're Japanese. I wasn't alive when my grandmother got the check, but I grew up hearing from my family that she said nothing would repay what happened to her. Sometimes I think, what did that check ever really do for her? In 1942, my grandma and her parents were forcibly removed from their home in the Bay Area of California. This was alongside over 100,000 other Japanese Americans who were also living on the West Coast. My family was sent to the Topaz Relocation Center, but many Japanese Americans referred to these centers as the camps. At the time that incarceration was announced, my grandma was 19, turning 20 years old at the time. That's usually when kids are just figuring out what they want to do with their lives. They're just becoming young adults. In 1943, though, she was able to apply to leave. So the War Relocation Authority was the government agency who was handling the incarceration of the Japanese Americans. And they created a questionnaire to be able to screen who was allowed to leave and who couldn't leave. But my grandma was not allowed to leave at that time because of how she answered question number 28. The question essentially asked, will you remain loyal to the United States? And my grandma said, if the United States is a true democracy, we should be treated alike from the time we were born, not from now on. Everything I learned about my grandma, I learned through my dad. And then later when she passed, we found her war relocation authority file. She had gotten it in 1985. That was in the height of the redress movement. So after the war ended, Japanese American organizations fought for the federal government to apologize and to give monetary compensation to make up for what was lost during the war. Part of that movement was fueled by the civil rights movement and also by the kids of those who were in the camps. They just learned about what happened to their parents when they were in school because their parents probably didn't really talk about it at home. And then in 1990, we got a formal presidential apology and people who were put in the camps received a $20,000 check. That's when my grandmother received hers. Right after the war, my grandma couldn't return to California. She told my family that it was just too painful for her. So she moved around to a few different cities before she landed in New York City. And I just can't imagine what it would be like to be living in a new city in my 20s, but living in an old country that didn't like people like me. There, she met my Chinese grandfather, and the rest is history. And today, I'm around the same age as she was when she moved to New York City. And I can't help but think, what would my life be like? How could I handle these things? And how would I feel if the government sent an apology to me 40 or 50 some odd years after my family's life and my life was torn apart? That's why I felt it was incredibly important to report on the New Jersey Reparations Task Force Bill. I cannot describe how the weight of my grandmother's pain pressed on me as I was reporting the story. The bill would create a committee to review how to create meaningful socioeconomic change and education opportunities for black descendants of enslaved Africans and African Americans. The second reason why I share this story is because I want to talk about why Japanese people were able to receive reparations in the first place. And meanwhile, black families have been struggling to fight for reparations since the end of slavery. So there's this idea that after World War II, Japanese people were seen as hardworking and subservient, when in actuality, they were just trying to fly under the radar given what just happened to them. And so they became a palatable ethnicity for a white government to give reparations to. And while Asian people as a whole have been receiving or experiencing an incredible amount of racism since the beginning of their immigration to the States, they haven't experienced this systemic racist brutality that black folks have to go through on a day-to-day -day basis. I'd be remiss if I didn't add this. My family got a second chance, and that's not something that most folks can say. My grandmother chose to move to New York City after the war, and had she not, she might have not met my Chinese grandfather at a Quaker party that they were holding to boost morale for Asian people after the war. So I want us to think about how conditional the American dream is, who gets to have it and who doesn't. 
And I very much think that I am alive today because my family got that other opportunity to start their lives over.